Bridges are an important part of rail running. They help the train pass over rivers, gorges, highways, etc. But when one goes out, it always ends in disaster. This is the story of the Tay Bridge Rail Disaster. On December 28, 1879, a train departed warm at Scotland bound for Dundee. The train had 70 passengers and 5 crew members. The Tay Bridge itself was a single track rail bridge supported by brick piers on bedrock. Construction started in 1871 and it was completed in 1877. However, in the center section of the bridge, the high girders, the bridge girders ran as two trusses above the pier tops with the girder with the railways inside them in order to give the clearance to allow passage of sailing ships. The bedrock actually lay much deeper than intended, so Sir Thomas Bouch, the designer of the bridge, had to completely redesign it with fewer piers and correspondingly longer span girders. The change in design increased cost and necessitated delay. So, to reduce the weight this had to support, Bouch used open lattice iron skeleton piers. <coughs> Each pier had multiple cast iron columns taking the weight, taking the weight of the bridge and girders. Wrought iron horizontal braces and diagonal tie bars link the columns in each pier to provide rigidity, rigidity, and stability. However, the however the bridge would be weak to heavy storms. The inspection note report notes: When again visiting the spot, I should wish, if possible, to have an opportunity. Of observing the effects of high wind when a train of carriages is running over the bridge. Regardless, the, the bridge was put into service and Bouch in June 1879 was knighted after Queen Victoria had used the bit bridge. Anyways, back to the train. It was making good time. However, there was trouble up ahead. A violent storm was blowing virtually at right angles to the train. I mean, the bridge. Witnesses said the storm was as bad as any they had seen in the 20 to 30 years they had lived in the area. One called it a hurricane, as bad as the typhoon he had seen in the China Sea. The wind speed was measured at 71 miles per hour or 114 kilometers per hour. Usage of the bridge was was restricted to one train at a time by a single block system, which was at the time a new thing. I used a baton as a token. At 7.13, a train from the south consisting of a 4-4-0 locomotive, its tender, five passenger coaches, and a luggage van picked up the baton and sped off. The single man turned away to his log to note this and tended the cab in the fireplace. Luckily, a friend present watched the train. He then saw sparks coming from the wheels on the east side of the south train. Which is obviously a bad thing. Eventually, Eventually, the train from the south had passed. Next up was the worm at Dundee. The sparks continued. The worm at Dundee had reached the high girders. But then, the bridge started to collapse, and then... There was a sudden bright flash of light, and in an instant, there was total darkness. The tail lamps of the train, the sparks and light flash all gone at the same instant. A single man's son 
saw none of this and when told about this by the friend did not believe it. When the train failed to appear on the line off the bridge and to Dundee, he tried to telegram the north signal cabin, but all communication had been lost. Dawn revealed the full scale of the disaster. Not only was the train in the river, but so were the high girders and much of their of the ironwork of their supporting piers. Divers were sent to explore <coughs> the twisted metal wreckage that was left of the train and bridge girders. They found the train still within the girders, with the engine in the fifth span of the Southern Five Band Division. There were no survivors, only 46 bodies were recovered, but there are 59 known victims. 56 tickets had been, rec- had been collected before crossing the bridge, determining there were 75 people on the train, those deaths were mentioned at the beginning. So what caused this terrible wreck to occur, and why? Well, the Court of Inquiry, which launched an investigation, Built to a greater report, although there, was mu- although there was much common ground, neither the foundations nor the girders were at fault. The quality of the wrought iron, well not the best, was not a factor. The cast iron was fairly good, but presented difficulty in casting. The workmanship and fitting of the piers were inferior in many respects. The cross bracing of the piers as fastens were too weak to survive the gales. Rothery complained that the cross bracing was not as substantial as well fitted as the Bill of Viaduct. Yawn and Barlow stated that the, that the weight slash cost of, of cross bracing was a disproportionately small fraction of the total weight slash cost of ironwork. There was insufficiently strict supervision of the Warmint Foundry, supervision of the grid after completion was unsatisfactory. Noble had no experience of ironwork nor any definite instruction to report on the ironwork. Nonetheless, Noble should have reported the loose ties using packing pieces, which might have fixed the piers in a distorted form. The 25 miles per hour. 40 kilometers per hour limit had not been enforced and frequently was exceeded. It's been 140 years since the tragedy. In 1880, Scottish poet William McGonagall, who has gained the reputation of the worst poet of history, made a poem about it. I like, in, I like the Wikipedia page in the description of both the poem and the. After the wreck, the bridge was completely destroyed and was rebuilt. The bridge still exists today. Here are the photos of the remains of the train after being pulled out from the river. So, I wasn't ready to record yet. (laughs) You big chungus dumb. I forgot there was another poem made about the disaster. Here it is on screen. Okay, bye.